What's up guys, it's James Allen, the out-of-state investor, and in today's video, I'm gonna tell you the story about my first ever multifamily property I purchased from out-of-state. This deal was a triplex, and this property alone produces up to $1,400 a month in cash flow after expenses. Now, this was just my second investment property that I ever purchased, and even though I made some big mistakes along the way, the cool thing about rental properties is you can make some big mistakes, and it doesn't hurt you the same way because you're in it for the long haul at the end of the day. And so you could just be more efficient next time on the next deal you do. So in this video, I'm gonna show you not only how I got a deal that could cash flow like this, but also how you can do it more efficiently than me, avoiding the same mistakes that I made. But before I break this down, do me a favor and smash that like button. And if it's your first time visiting the channel, I buy rental properties and flip houses, and I teach you guys how you can do the same, building massive wealth by investing in real estate. And not only that, but how you can get smarter with your personal finances. So if any of that sounds interesting, definitely subscribe, hit that notification bell. And with that said, let's jump into it. So for those of you who follow me, I started my journey in real estate investing in the Atlanta metro area. And that first deal I did really well. I talk about it in a video talking about the first ever deal I did where I made about $42,000 on it. But the prices started going up so much that I wasn't able to get the same kind of deals I got on that first deal. So I started looking for a new area to invest in and I came upon the Knoxville market. So you might be wondering why Knoxville, Tennessee of all the markets I could have chosen. Well, the main reason above all is it was a great market for a combination of cash flow and appreciation. In addition to that, it was in a landlord friendly state. It had strong job growth, steady population growth. And on top of all that, it also had a lot of new developments going on with its downtown north redevelopment projects and south waterfront projects. So it was a lot of exciting things going on in the city of Knoxville. Now, in particular, I was looking for a multifamily property and I managed to find a triplex on the MLS at the time. It was in a C plus area. It had pretty good rents compared to the price they were asking for. So overall, I felt like it was a pretty good opportunity to get the cash flow I was looking for. So they were asking about $145,000 for this property. And this property did need a little bit of work, but even in its current Current condition, there was a one bedroom unit that was currently rented out at 475, another one bedroom unit that was rented out at 450, and then there was a three bedroom unit that was completely vacant at the time, but even in as is condition, it could probably rent out at about 750 a month. So my total rents for that house could come out to close to $1,700 a month, which compared to the $145,000 price tag, it could work out to be a pretty good deal as far as cash flow is concerned. And not to mention that there was the potential for value add where you can improve the property, get even better cash flow, and increase the value of the property too. So that was a part I really liked about it as well. So I made an offer on this property the minute it got listed, like literally the first day it got listed, I put in an offer at full price. We had to put 25% down, which by the way is the minimum you can do on a multifamily property when you're using financing. Well, they responded to us and they told us there were multiple offers on the property, including some cash offers. So we knew we had to do something to separate ourselves from the cash offers so that we could win this deal. So in the end, we offered $8,699 over asking which kind of cracks me up now looking back on it because we thought that that little, if we offer $10 more than that person that's gonna win us the deal, when in reality, they're gonna look at the terms and the full picture of the offer. But then in addition to that, we also asked for $3,000 in closing concessions so that we would save money out of pocket that we could pay at the closing table and I'd rather finance that over 30 years. Now, the reason we only did $3,000 in closing concessions versus more than that is because there's actually a limit on investment properties of the amount of closing concessions you can request and that is 2% of the value of the house. So if you're buying it for $150,000, then you can only ask for $3,000 on it. So after my inspection was done, I ended up flying out there just to make sure the property looked the same in person and I could walk through everything, see the layouts, meet the tenants, things of that nature. And everything seemed fine at that point, so I decided to move forward on this deal. So at this point, I'd already made two big mistakes and I didn't even realize it. The first big mistake is that this property had city property taxes. Now, most properties only have county property taxes. And I had done the due diligence, I looked it up on the tax assessor's website and I saw what the county property taxes were. And so I put that into my cash flow numbers and that looked good, but I didn't account for the fact that there may be city property taxes too. The second big mistake I made is I didn't include it in the contract to include security deposits and prorated rents for the tenants that were there. Now, normally you don't even have to do this and the landlord or the seller will just naturally provide that to you. But this guy was being particularly difficult. I think he could tell 
I really wanted this property. And so he just played it difficult since it wasn't in writing and it wasn't in the contract. He just decided he wasn't going to give it to me. Now, maybe I could have fought this if I really wanted to, but at the end of the day, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. So hiring an attorney for such a small amount of money didn't really make a lot of sense. So at this point, I kind of just had to take it as a loss and a lesson learned. And I always put it in my contracts from there on out that you have to give me the security deposits and the prorated rents at closing. So at the end of the day, I ended up closing even with the city taxes, which by the way, included trash pickup. So I made a little bit of that money back. But at the end of the day, I closed on the deal. I was really excited at this point and I couldn't wait to start cash flowing, especially once I got that third unit rented out. So just one week into owning the property, the craziest thing ever happens. Now at this point, I'm still excited. I'm still thinking about all the cash flow I'm going to make on this property and how good of an investment this was. But then I find out and I get the news that one of my tenants just committed suicide. Now it was a very stressful situation and I actually met the guy. He was a really nice guy and I don't know what was going on in his head at the time that caused him to want to do that. But there were a lot of emotions at play. On one hand, I'm wondering, you know, what caused him to do this? You know, why would he want to take his life? And then on the other hand, I'm thinking, what does this mean for this investment? Is this going to ruin it? Am I going to never be able to rent the unit out again? Is this going to cause me to lose a lot of money? So there's a lot of emotions at play with the situation. Well, I can't tell you enough how helpful it was to have third party property management in that situation. You see, my property management was able to help out with everything. They cleaned out the unit. They were able to help out with the family issues of helping them get their belongings and things of that nature. And so they were really the superheroes in all of this. And it really helped me out because if I had to deal with that from out of state, I don't even know what I would do in that situation. So at this point, there were two vacant units. One of them was rented at 475. The other two units were completely vacant. And on top of all that, we didn't have the funds for a complete renovation. So we just had to do the minimal amount of work like touch-ups, clean up, things like that, whatever we could do to just get the units back on the market and rent it out again. So we ended up getting the units rented out, the one bedroom rented out at 525 a month and the three bedroom rented out at 745 a month. So the total amount of gross rents we got for that building was $1,745 a month. Now our monthly expenses with our principal, interest, taxes, insurance came out to $820 a month. So when you include all the other expenses in there, it was cash flow, but it wasn't a lot of cash flow. So at first the situation was pretty good. We were getting our cash flow, you know, they were paying on time, but then shortly after that, they started falling behind on rent. They were getting late and then later and then later. And the next thing you know, they were a month behind and the excuses started piling up until the point where we actually had to evict both new tenants. So at the same time as all of this, the third tenant we had was coming up to the end of her lease. Now we decided to non-renew her because she kept getting bed bugs because she wasn't really clean and the way she kept the place was kind of attracting them. And every time the bed bugs would come, it would wipe out that month's rent, if not even more than that. And so we saw that it wasn't really a good investment for us to keep her as a tenant. So at this point, the triplex is completely vacant. There's no more tenants in there. There's no more more income coming in, but it is the perfect time for us to renovate the place, bring up the rents tremendously, increase the value of the property, and start the first out-of-state rehab that I ever did. So the next step was putting together a scope of work. Now this was my first attempt at this, and so I kind of figured out what I was going to do, but fortunately I also had help from the property management company who was able to take some video footage for me of the units, and that way I could put together a proper scope of work. I started interviewing contractors, and once I picked the right one I wanted to work with, I checked with them to make sure that they were licensed and insured. We put together a proper written contract to make sure everything was sorted out from payment schedules to start and end dates. And you know, we put in like a 5% penalty if they were going too long, but also a 5% bonus if they finished on time or early. So we started the rehab on the first unit and I completely overdid it. I spent too much money on that unit because I was so focused on not having to deal with another eviction. I didn't want to deal with tons of vacancy again. So I did whatever it took to not have to deal with that circumstance again. So I spent $33,000 on this one unit alone, which again was too much money to spend. I was able to bring rents up from $525 a month up to $870 a month. So overall, when push comes to shove, I ended up getting a 12.5% return on investment, which is not bad, but I could have done it so much better looking back on it now. There's so many things I would have done differently. Some of the things I messed up on with this unit is I put in crown molding, which was completely unnecessary for a multi-unit. I put in expensive of granite countertops when I could have done even like a tier one granite or even laminate countertops would have been better for that. And on top of that, I put in like glass tile backsplashes and stuff like that to go real high end with it. I think I was just so desperate to get a person that will actually pay rent on time and will actually be a good tenant that I was 
was willing to pay whatever it took to do it. But that was the wrong approach and I definitely could have done that better. So with the other two units, I did get a little better with my choices of renovations and how I could be a little savvier with my choices where I could save money and things of that nature. And on top of that, I was replacing things like the HVACs and stuff like that because they were really at the end of their life expectancy. So the total cost of all three units, full renovation, was $77,000. So as far as rents go, I was able to take the one bedroom unit from $475 a month up to $675 a month. I was able to take the three bedroom unit from $745 a month to $945 a month. And I already told you about the one bedroom unit that I turned into a two bedroom unit. And I was able to take that from $525 a month all the way up to $870 a month. So my total rents went from $1,745 a month up to $2,490 a month. And in addition to that, we were able to sub-meter the water, which basically means that we didn't have to pay the water bill anymore because we could put that onto the tenants. That alone saved us $150 a month in cash flow. So in total, that was part of the $77,000 rehab budget we had. And so in total, we increased our cash flow by $895 a month, which was a 14% return on investment. So with that said, here's the breakdown of how the cash flow looked after the renovations were done. So the rents came out to $2,490 a month. The principal interest taxes and insurance were $820 a month. The lawn maintenance cost $50 a month. The property management fees was 8% of gross rents, which came out to $199 a month. Now, as far as utilities go, we didn't have to pay anything because we had already submetered the water, which put the water bill onto the tenants and the city taxes already covered trash bills and the electrical and stuff like that was already covered by the tenants. So we had no money to spend as far as utilities was concerned. So in a good performing month, we could make as much as $1,421 a month in pure cash flow. Now, obviously things can happen. You're gonna need maintenance on the property, there are capital expenditures that can come up, there are vacancies that can happen. So when you account for all that, we budget about $375 a month towards that, just in case of future things like vacancy and maintenance. So overall, this is what the final numbers looked like, and I'm gonna even include budgeting for future vacancy and maintenance and capital expenditures, things like that. So we purchased it for $153,699, very specific number. We also put a 25% down payment. So that means we were in about $38,500. We put down $4,000 for closing costs. We spent $77,000 on the rehab. So the total cost of the whole project came out to $119,500. Now, in addition to that, keep in mind the cash flow when you budget in things like future vacancy and maintenance and capital expenditures comes out to more like $1,046 a month. So when you break that down, the total ROI on your cash flow comes out to about 10.5%. Now the 10.5% return on investment that I'm talking about is purely on cash flow. So it's important to look at the big picture because you make money in real estate in more than one way. You obviously have principal pay down, which is when your tenant pays down your mortgage for you. You have appreciation, you have tax benefits, and you have value add. And speaking of value add, when we did the value add to this property, we originally purchased it at $150,000 and it's been appraised since then at about $250,000. So there was about a $100,000 increase in value from those renovations. So like I said, this was my first ever rehab I did out of state and there's no doubt about it, I made some major mistakes on this one. So I wanna go over some of the major mistakes I made so that you can avoid these when you try to do the same thing. The first mistake I made is the contractor I used actually wasn't licensed after everything. So he wasn't sure, but he wasn't licensed and he told me he was licensed, but I made the mistake of not checking on that. You see, the states many times have a registry that you can actually run the license number through to make sure they are what they say they are. So I highly recommend doing that. Ask for a copy of their license. Don't be embarrassed to do that. Another big mistake I made is because I was ripping out all the flooring and doing a lot of work like that, I should have taken this time to replace the plumbing because the house had old galvanized steel pipes. Now those pipes are very notorious for having leaks and high maintenance costs and things of that nature. So if you have a house that's built before the 1980s, like in the 60s, 70s, 50s, things like that. Lots of contractors use those galvanized steel pipes. So check if the plumbing's been updated. And if it's not, when you're doing a full rehab like that, definitely take advantage of that time to do that. The third 
third and most obvious mistake I made is I just overspent on this project altogether. I shouldn't have spent so much money into the rehab of this property, but you know what? It's a lesson learned. We all have to learn in some way or another, and we're gonna get our education through experience. So that was a big lesson learned for me is not to overspend on your rehabs. So overall, this was really a good learning experience more than anything. This is not a deal I'm highlighting in terms of like, man, look at this killer deal. It's really more of like a, hey, this is what I learned because the return on investment, although it's not that bad overall, I could have done a lot better if I had another go at that today. And so overall, it's really good lessons learned that I can use in future deals from now to where I can make more money. With that said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you feel like you gained some value from it, go ahead, do me a favor and smash that like button. And also if you like this kind of content, just subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can be alerted the minute we post a new video. Also, let me know in the comments, where are you guys at in your real estate journey? Have you guys started yet? Have you learned any major lessons along the way? I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. Lastly, follow me on Instagram at the out of state investor. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you on the next one.